Hey everyone, we're so glad that you could be here today. I'm Alex Robinson, and this is Will Mitchell. Hey everybody. And we are with the Turing School of Software and Design. Yeah! yeah. That's right. <laughs> um, I'm the back-end engineering director, and what that means is that I come alongside our instructional teams on the, in the back-end program, and I help support our instructors um, to thrive and to help show up for the students every day um, in the best way that they can. I also help oversee the curriculum to make sure that we are uh, you know, using um, best practices in terms of how we instruct our students um, and helping to ensure successful student outcomes. So. And I'm Will. And I am the director of our front end program, so my job is exactly the same as Alex's, but I do it for our front end team. So yeah. I focus on JavaScript and React development, although yeah. I did used to be a Rails developer, so yeah. I, I have some context. How many Turing like alum do we have in the room? A couple? Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Welcome. Glad you're, glad you're here. Yeah, glad you could be here. Cool. Well, we're going to be doing um, a fair amount of like interactivity, interactive elements today. Um, so we're going to just start with an icebreaker, a little warm up, get to know you. So uh, this is called Hive Mind. So like find a group of three to four people. You can maybe just turn and, and face some people. But on your own, write down answers to the following questions. Don't share them yet. So the first question, what are the three best text editors? Second question, name three things that you do in water. And third question, what are three things that you would put in a box? And we'll take, what do you think? Two minutes. Two minutes, go. So, now you need to turn and meet some people and score yourselves. So, you're gonna go around and share your answers. You get one point every time somebody says an answer that you wrote down. So if you wrote down swimming for something you do in water and two other people in the group also wrote that down, you get two points. And we'll give you another two minutes to tally your scores. And also introduce yourselves. Yes. And share your names. All right, 10 second warning. Cool. Anybody have 20 points or more? Raise your hand. No? Nobody? 10 points or more? 10 points or more. Okay. Uh, how many points do you have? 16. In the back, how many points do you have? 12. I think 16 is our winner unless anybody can beat it. Well done. Congratulations. <laughs> your, your prize is a notebook and a pen. Uh, so. <laughs> Cool. Well, thank you all so much for coming today. Um, so name of the workshop is Intentional Team Building. I think that's what we called it when we pitched it. Um, what is that going to mean today? So we are going to be talking about as a group and uh, working together on uh, values-driven organizations. So what does it mean to be a values-driven organization? Essentially and this is just what my definition is that I threw together, having a set of guiding principles that allow all stakeholders to thrive. So that could be your entire organization, the company you work for, or it could be just your small team that you work on. So we're gonna be uh, diving in a little bit today to like the definitions of that, see some examples, and then we're gonna do a workshop um, trying to add a new uh, value to an existing team. So why do this? What are some of the benefits of being value driven? There are a lot, a lot more than four, but some of the ones that um, I wanted to highlight are team happiness, productivity, innovation, and retention. Um, if you're doing this as a team, if you are maximizing these things, you're probably enjoying your work, and as a result, the um, people who benefit from your work are enjoying the results of it. So, strictly speaking, Costco is not what you would think of as a tech company. 
um, and I'm, I'm guessing nobody in here works for Costco. But Costco is a really good example of a company that puts values front and center in uh, the work that they do. So if you do some research on Costco, you'll find that collaboration and teamwork is something that they value highly. Uh, everyone at Costco works on a small team within the, um, the particular building that they're uh, working out on a daily basis. They highly value employee training and growth um, in, the, in fostering the development of the workers that are at Costco. And a positive attitude and a um, value of customer service and satisfaction is top of mind. As a like, retail store, right? They, they, it's very important to them that the people coming into Costco uh, feel that they're being greeted by friendly people and that the, uh, uh, the, their problems are solved in a quick and friendly manner. So what are the results of pushing this in your organization? Well, for Costco in particular, they have realized employee turnover that's less than half of comparable businesses. So think Walmart, Target, more lately uh, Amazon. Their average worker pay is over $41,000 a year, which I realize is not a big number, um, but it is in most states approaching a living wage, and it's more than 40% more than the average at those same comparable businesses. They have a devoted customer base. I know because I'm one of those devoted customers. <laughs> Maybe somebody else in the room is. And over the last 25 years, the company has grown in value over 7,000%, uh, which is a really astounding number for, for a company that is so focused on just providing a good experience to their customers and their employees. So we're gonna define some terms. Behaviors and values. The behaviors of your organization, the way your team acts, the way the organization acts, define what your culture actually is. Culture is not a ping pong table, right? When you see that walking in, that's not the culture of the organization. The culture is how your organization acts and behaves. And the values that your company holds, be they implicit or explicit, determine those behaviors. So, Quick terms, an explicit value is what you state as critical to the success of your team or your organization. So um, in the case of Costco, right, we saw that they um, are def they're defining uh, collaboration and teamwork as very important to them. Uh, they're defining a positive attitude as very important to them. Implicit values, are the unstated or unwritten rules that are guiding your team or organization. Uh, so maybe in your organization, transparency is very important, but nobody actually took the time to write down transparency. It's just the way that people tend to behave. That's an implicit value. And that's a, probably an example of a good implicit value, but it can go the other way, right? An implicit value could be, uh, this company seems to value people spending a lot of extra time at their desk. Um, nobody's saying you have to do that, but a lot of us have been to an organization where that seems to be what you're asked to do without anybody telling you specifically to do it. Um, so those implicit values can have a, uh, a negative effect on your culture. And finally, behavior is the actual manifestation of those values in your organization, be they implicit or explicit. So what do you see um, as a result of defining these values um, or what do you see as a result of some implicit values that may not be defined? So before we move on, enough of me just talking at all of you, since this is a workshop, um, we're gonna do a little bit of a turn and talk. So uh, find a neighbor, find a friend, or a group of three, if you're over here. Um, and what are some, uh, are you familiar with any other organizations that prioritizes values to drive their organization? What values do they promote and what impact do you think it has? And if you can't think of anything, what are some implicit values that you see in your current organization? We'll take five minutes for this part. Have at it. All right. Would love to hear from a few groups on what you discussed. This is Robin. She's giving us a hand today. Everybody say hi, Robin. Hi. 
<laughs> um, so yeah, just would love to hear from some volunteers about uh, what, what organization uh, or like what implicit values have you seen in your own organization? Yeah, in the back. Hi, yeah, um, I've worked before with HashRocket uh, and uh, ThoughtBot, and one of the things both those organizations um, have like implicit in the way they hire and mentor their, their members, uh, they call it HAT, or at least at HashRocket it was called HAT, hum uh, humility, accessibility, and teachability. And that, uh, that's how they hire, and then once you have those people on your staff, they continue to mentor them and bring them up to senior status within just a couple of years. It, it, and it's carried over, you know, uh, we hired them as an agency, and that carried over to our group after interfacing with them, because they, they taught us a lot. Yeah, that's super cool, how like it can, those, those values can then start to like spread out yes. um, into, and we into had a other second places. Example, too, that Vincent knew. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, uh, we, the second example was more something that I experienced at a company I worked for, uh, which is more an implicit one, like transparency. And it's actually interesting, after discussing it, that it can have two, two sides to that coin, because for a lot of people it was really nice to for the example I had that our CEO basically every month we would have a, an all hands meeting with uh, he would show revenue key metrics just the Excel sheet or the Google Drive sheet that he was using himself to just like well this is where we are. The, the fun thing there is like for a lot of people it's like wow cool good to know but some others at some point actually got scared by that because maybe they were seeing well hey we're not making revenue or we're not making profit or whatever and so that, that's an interesting uh, concept of well transparency is it good or bad in that sense for your for your uh, team spirit in a company. Yeah, it's, it's funny you bring that up. I actually, as I was like thinking about this talk, I knew I was gonna use transparency as an example. I'm like, well, it can be a little bit of a struggle, like working in an organization where transparency is very important, but cool. Uh, who else? No? Cool, all right. There will be plenty of opportunities to, to share out, so. I'm gonna get off the stage, come down a little bit closer to you. So right now, we're going to do a case study. So we're going to take some time to learn a little bit more about Turing and about Turing's instructional teams. Um, what we're going to cover is um, a little bit about a day in the life of an instructor at Turing. So you're going to see kind of what their responsibilities are. We're also going to look at what our explicit instructional values are. And then we're gonna also read through some of the behaviors that we see exhibited by the instructors. And can I get a hand raise? Who all is familiar with Turing and with the Turing School? Okay, so I see a few. For those of you who aren't familiar, Turing is a seven month accelerated developer training program. It is fully remote and it, the way it works is students come through the program they spend six weeks in four different parts of the program, and each week you have, um, after the six weeks, you have a week off in between. Um, and so there's a front end and a back end program. Um, front end is React, JavaScript. Um, back end is Ruby and Rails. So what I'd like for you to do, if you have the Discord channel pulled up, um, go ahead and look at the intentional team building channel and you're gonna see a link to a GitHub repo. I know some of you have already pulled that up. Um, when you have that up, I want you to click on the um, case study. And we're gonna take the next five minutes just to read through that um, and get a sense of all, all of that information. And then we're gonna spend some time in groups discussing. Okay. What I want you to do is I want you to go back to your original groups of about three to four people. And why did I have you read through that? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to figure out and identify what you know, the explicit values are and maybe what some of the implicit values are. And that is you know, after reading through the behavior of the instructors. And I want you to answer these three questions. Um, are there any behaviors that you can map to the explicit values? What behaviors do you see that may be the result of implicit values? And what are possible implicit values driving these behaviors? So those three questions, see if you can identify and maybe discuss um, these values with your group. 
I'm gonna give you a little bit longer. We'll give you about 10 minutes um, to talk and discuss. And Will and I are gonna be walking through the room. If you have questions, um, feel free to flag us down and, and we'll come chat with you. Okay, let's come back together. I would love to hear um, some of what your groups discussed for the first question. So, um, if you wouldn't mind sharing what you talked about in terms of behaviors that you can map to the explicit values shared in that case study. Can I get some volunteers? Yay, Sage, go ahead. Um, something that our group talked about um, just linking um, the value that's listed um, here, the um, accountability to achieve a high standard of professional um, performance and technical performance, um, and the behavior about um, like iterating over curriculum and um, constantly trying to make that better. Um, I think those two things are linked, and we need to discuss that in our group. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Love it. Anyone else? Anyone else link some behaviors to explicit values? Heard a lot of good conversation over here. Would you like to share anything that you talked about? Okay. All right. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Go for it. I also saw a hand back there as well. Um, the a culture of inquiry built upon a safe, trusting environment where students can take risks, be vulnerable, and ask for help, is also the, the also the first bullet point of where instructors enjoy working with students and find fulfillment in seeing students learn, and apply and apply challenging tech, technical concepts. Yeah, it just that's that's a map for me. Yeah, absolutely, awesome. Okay, let's talk about maybe something a little bit harder to identify. Um, what behaviors do you see or did y'all talk about that might be the result of implicit values? So some that aren't stated. So there's a lot in there about the instructors being available in the evenings and feeling like mentally and emotionally exhausted at the end of the day. Um, yeah. And we felt that the implicit value there was that the students come first. Yeah, absolutely. Love it. Anyone else? Anyone else have anything that they identified? I think another one of the implicit, um, but I mean the same implicit values that the students come first also was manifest in the instructors not taking their professional development time because there was there's always a more important student thing to be working on and so there was never a time for that. Yep, absolutely, awesome. So that implicit value we might say is students come first, right? What were there any other implicit values that y'all identified? Uh, to that same point about uh, instructors always being available after work, we wondered, is an implicit value that if students get stuck, it's more important that they ask instructors for help as opposed to uh, either be comfortable with discomfort or if they like try to push through themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and something else we noted, I'm not sure if this directly answers the question, but there was a list of student values but there wasn't a list of like values for instructors. Um, and so that seemed interesting that like we were watching downstream of what happens when there's explicit values for a student experience, but not for an instructor experience. That, yeah, that is really good. Good point there. Any other, yeah, back here. Yeah, I want to piggyback on exactly what that guy just said. There, but one of the things we talked about was there might be a missing uh, value of displaying what personal professional development the instructors have been through. Yeah. Um, and we got the chance to, to talk to you know, one of the speakers just a second ago. He actually reiterated that, um, yeah, it, it does actually help whenever the instructors are able to show, I made this mistake. This is where I went wrong. Yep. But also celebrating, hey, I made the mistake. I, I tried this thing on the side, or I went to this conference and, and kind of 
having a culture of celebrating those sorts of things, yep. uh, it not being explicit might be, it might kind of uh, tend towards, you know, that, that always being available for students, even in off hours. Yep. Yeah. Love it. That's great. All right. Well, could you go to the next one? Okay. So let's talk about how you might introduce a new explicit value. Um, and so the value that we're going to think about today is how to introduce the value of professional development, okay? Of really taking advantage of the professional development opportunities. And really, I would say maybe it's a more a value of like continued growth for instructors. So let's think about the why. If we were to think about the context of Turing, this might be important because as instructors themselves are learning and growing, they're better able to empathize with the students and that student experience. Um, when you are growing, when you are learning, um, you experience greater levels of engagement in your work when that can be a part of your work um, and also personal fulfillment. And that can be definitely more energizing in, in your day-to-day -day work as well. Um, and then you become more of an asset to yourself, you become more of an asset to your team, and then ultimately you become more of an asset to students. So, and I think you can translate this out of, you know, into any context, into whatever work that you're doing. And what we wanna think about is, if you go to the next slide, thank you. What we want to think about is how would we introduce this value of continual growth into the team, okay? So what behaviors would you want to see from your team? What would encourage buy-in? Maybe everyone's not on board with this value. And how many people in your team would need to be on board in order for this value to really take hold? Lastly, we're going to do a little bit of a share out at the end, um, and I'd love to hear um, if you had any ideas that y'all talked about that maybe you'd want to incorporate into your own work. So we're going to take another 10 minutes. Go ahead, go back to your groups and talk about these questions. Think about strategies and approaches for how you would instill this new value in this team. All right, I'd love to hear you all talk about, thanks Robin. Um, yeah, maybe some strategies for how you would introduce this new value. So I think it's you know something that's interesting that maybe isn't stated, but I find that there's a difference between saying, hey, this is important, and then having everyone else also believe that it's important. There's a gap there. So I'm really curious how y'all would kind of bridge that gap and, and help the team um, really adopt this value. Does anyone want to share? Yeah, go ahead. I think something we talked about a lot was uh, share outs of like, because they have the, uh, the $1,200 learning and development stipend. Yep. And so having, having share outs not only of like, hey, I'm going to this conference or hey, I'm, I'm taking this course, do other people want to take it with me? Because that, that helps, uh, that increases the experience anyway. Yeah. But also having like, hey, I went to this conference or I took this course and it's, yeah. it's really helped me better engage with my students or better, like I changed my curriculum because of it. So having, having yeah. a lot of like vocal share outs, because we, we were kind of talking about the, the percentage of team members and we thought like it's, it's much more important, like you could have five, 10% of people be super bought in and super vocal about it. And that's gonna be way more impactful than if like 50% of people are doing it, but they keep it to themselves and they're just like, oh, I yeah. went to this conference, it was fine. Um, yeah. Yeah, I love it. So finding opportunities to kind of publicly celebrate and share, you know, what you're doing and the impact that that's having. Yeah. Yeah, another thing we talked about was this sort of things coming down from leadership. So yep. like the leadership should start talking about what they're doing for professional development and lead by that example so that then everyone can see that template and start working. And then we also talked about how having the instructors share their professional development with the students so that they see what it looks like for the people to learn throughout their careers and have that value instilled in them 
for, for the years that come out of their career. Absolutely. Yeah, so, and I think it's really interesting to like include all of the stakeholders. So it's not just about the instructors, but also the students really benefit from that as well. Um, and having them be on board is also important. Um, okay, so I'm curious if um, anyone had identified, you know, maybe some other behaviors. So we talked about publicly sharing, um, you know, what you're doing, any other behaviors that you'd maybe want to see to know that this is a value that is really instilled within the team? Yeah. I was thinking that like some sort of explicit incentivization to, to get to sort of for people to see the value. Because you know, to what you were saying before that, you know, I, you know, you can propose a value, and I think even everyone understands and thinks, agrees that it's a good idea, but then there's about prioritizing the time to, to get it done. And yeah. it's, it's so much more easy to prioritize kind of helping students because it's clear that like if they graduate and get a good job, like that's a direct, you know, yeah. aspect of that. Whereas like if you don't go to this course, like what's the issue? That I guess like in two or three years, your students will be less desirable, but that's, that's a much looser feedback loop. It's gonna be really hard. So yeah. something about their maybe professional development can be tied to like a career ladder or something could be tied to the fact that they go to these kinds of courses um, or, mm. you know, or, or, or some other kind of public, um, you know, just complimenting them and, and saying that, that they did a good job. And so it feels a little bit antithetical to the idea of a value to have like explicit requirements kind of built into its fulfillment, but I think, yeah. I think it's an effective way to, to get it done. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point. It does, something like that never feels immediate, like I have to do this now, whereas a student who's struggling, that feels like, oh, that's really immediate, and you can kind of see the outcome, right, more easily of that student. So how do you make you know, that professional development or something that feels a little bit more ambiguous, how do you make that feel important for right now? Alex, I got to talk with this group in front as well, yeah. and there was, there was one cool idea that, I, that came out of that discussion that I really liked, which is like, how do we overcome the blank canvas problem, right? Like, yeah. I wanna do some professional development, the ocean is in front of me, like, what do, how do I choose this? And instead of yeah. just saying, you can do whatever you want, what if, you can do one of these four things or whatever you want, but you have to do something. Yeah. Um, and, and so you don't have that same like fallback of like, uh, I could choose anything, so I did nothing. Yep, yeah, and I think that's a great point too. It's like there are lots of different reasons, you know, why you might not want to spend time on professional development. It might not just be that a student needs your help, but it might be, that you don't have an idea of what to focus on. And so I really like thinking about all the different kind of underlying reasons that something isn't necessarily valued by a team. Um, and that's a great, a great strategy and a great example there. All right, so you know, when we're thinking about this, we're thinking about this in the context of it being you know, instructors you know, in a classroom setting in a school, um, what what are the students for you all? I heard, I think Sal in the back kind of asked this question to his group, but it was, what are the things, if you think about in your own teams, in your own work, that might be keeping you from focusing on professional development? If you had to think about kind of what those would be, what are some examples of what those would be? Just to be clear, the question was, what are things stopping you from this value? Yeah. Uh, something we talked about was how difficult it can be to take time off. So like, if there's not a structure, or uh, if there's not an easy structure around if I want to spend my $1,200 on deep learning at this conference or workshop, you're just not going to take it. Um, and then oftentimes if you do not have the structure to support you taking time off to do that deeper learning, then you're going to engage in more shallow behavior, in like more shallow learning, just yeah. like reading a book and then people's $1,200 don't get spent. Uh, so I think not having explicit structures and supports around people being able to do more long-term, deeper, richer learning um, would be one of the obstacles. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. All right, I see a hand right here. Um, something that we talked about was that, you know, 
we think, okay, we gotta do professional development, but then there's also so many things that need to get done. We have deadlines for our projects, for features that we need to get out. So we focus, like, we gotta get this done, we'll do that later, we'll push it off. Yep. Um, so that's something that keeps us, uh, personally, that's, that's happened to me at work. We had these things called Fridays which on Fridays we, did, we were supposed to not work and just focus on PD all day. And uh, that never happened. <laughs> also, uh, being a Turing alum, we had our days where we did professional development, um, but we also had our projects that we needed to get done. So we were like, why do we have to go to professional development? I just need to get this done. I, <laughs> I have a deadline. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it's sometimes not having that like on like self like I guess like how do you say it like pushing yourself to like actually stop focusing on like the projects and everything else and actually focus on your professional development yeah yeah for sure did I see I see a hand right here as well and then we'll come back to you uh, I think the mental and emotional bandwidth is a big part of it, and it's something that yeah. has already been observed in the instructors that they're feeling emotionally drained at the end of the day, and I think that's a really common thing in a lot of teams is, especially if you're highly involved in your team and you want it to succeed, you end up giving everything to it, and then you don't have the time and energy. Even if you have the time or the money to go do a course, you might not have the energy to yeah. really dedicate yourself to it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, last one back here. Uh, yeah, that was a res uh, I want to respond to what you were saying about like, uh, uh, yeah, I want to work on PD on Friday, but there's this project to be finished, etc. I think it's also good that then, for example, your manager could cover for you there, right? So that, that they could say, hey, well, you were working on, no, they were not working on this project right now because we, we explicitly said that they should also work on personal development. And so if they can give you that cover, uh, I mean, I rarely think that a project is late just because you miss one day, right? So, it, I mean, probably you're not working on a trivial task anyway. So, it's how much much difference does it one day they make if you if you spend actually on the personal development thing? So, yeah, yeah. My point being, I think uh, it would be great if if a manager could then cover your uh, so that you feel more actually uh, empowered to actually do that and say, well, hey, um, refer to him or or her um, when when I get complaints about this project not being finished. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's multiple components to it, right? There's this whole kind of like self-discipline and it's on you to kind of do it, but then there's also some structural components. There has to be some support within the leadership and the organization to really, you know, help kind of assist and support in that. So, yeah. All right. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the things that we've been doing at Turing. And so this, this case study is actually real. It's real life. Surprise. <laughs> you know, surprise. Um, and one of the things that, that I want to talk about first is a little bit of my experience um, working with our back-end team, with our team of back-end instructors. Um, when we first started to kind of introduce this idea of, hey, Continued growth is really important. Professional development is really important. There was a period of time where we had to go through and really develop and kind of increase the buy-in for that. And so I think some of you accurately kind of pointed out some of these implicit values of like students come first. The most important thing is student success. So if a student is, you know, having an issue or if students need my attention, I'm going to give them that first rather than focus on myself. Um, and so, you know, it really was about kind of stepping down to the kind of foundational level of, well, what is really best for students? And I think, I think you may have pointed out, someone over here pointed out, like, if a student is struggling, is it better to maybe let that student sit with the information for a little bit and be a little bit uncomfortable? And that's something we've talked about as a team as well. We call it productive struggle where you allow, yeah, <laughs> y'all remember, um, where you, you know, allow someone to really kind of sit, think about the problem, try different things, and really make connections before giving them the answer. Um, and another thing we talked about is, what is the benefit to students of you continuing to grow? 
And that was something that, that instructors really needed to kind of sit down and think through and, and talk about together. So giving that room, giving them room for discussion um, and saying, this is a priority. Um, what do y'all think about it? Or where are you at with this? Was, was something that was really vital. And just opening up that space. Um, another, another aspect of the buy-in as well was to think about how to remove some of those barriers. And in some cases, they were just a matter of kind of like self-discipline. And when you see other people doing it, then you're more likely to also do it yourself. And so it was important to have those public kind of share outs to say, hey, this is what I'm doing. This is how I'm doing it. This is the impact. And then more people can get bought in. But it's also important to have some of that organizational structure we're like, hey, we're going to carve out some time, and we're going to hold this space to talk about this because this is important. Um, and having a reminder of like, hey, what are you doing for PD this inning? You know, what are, what are your plans? Um, and to be able to talk about that together. And I think lastly, one of the most important things was it wasn't really up to the leadership necessarily to you know, figure out this is, this is how, you know, we're going to go about making this a priority for the team. It was really just about creating the space and granting the permission for the instructors to be able to figure out what works best for us. How can we, what are the ideas that we come up with to really make this a priority for us? And what will this look like for us? And so it was really cool to sit back and kind of see um, with the back-end team specifically, how they started to implement things on their own to make that a priority. Um, so I'm going to stop there. I'm going to let Will talk a little bit more about the front-end team. Yeah, so we've, we followed a very similar pattern on the front-end team, and we had a lot of discussions about the importance of creating space for this professional development. Um, both in the, like, in the life of an instructor, obviously, but also for the student, like it is, the, the student's experience is enhanced by the instructor gradually enhancing their own skills. Uh, and like we've been hammering that home over and over and over again. On the front end team, every seven weeks before we start a new cohort of students, we set up the calendar for like what is that coming, uh, coming in and going to look like. And one of the things that we've been doing is having everybody on the team set aside time in their calendar to jealously guard that is for their professional development. Um, one of the things that we've also been doing is celebrating those, those pieces of PD. So a few people identified that as a potential strategy. And it is really helpful to have people go around and say, this is what I've been doing with my time. Um, and this is kind of some of the things that have happened as a result of it. One of our instructors started their own podcast. Um, it enabled them to build a whole bunch of new skills that they hadn't uh, previously engaged with. They had a lot of, uh, they've had a lot of new conversations with people in the industry. And as an organization, we've actually brought people in who like found us through that podcast, which is really exciting. I've also had an instructor uh, use that time to take a Udacity course on game development. We don't teach game development at Turing, and we're probably never going to teach game development, but it is still a valuable thing for him to learn, and it's a valuable um, context to give to the students. And it has been cool to see people engage in this work. I will say that it's not, like, easy. People, like, those, as you all identified that implicit value of students come first, it's really hardwired into the instructional experience. And some instructors, like, they will say, well, like, yeah, I have this plan for my professional development, but then, an like, a student reached out and, like, I, I had to stop and I had to, like, help them. So we have to keep coming back to it. It is small steps over a very long period of time, um, and that is, uh, you know, that's a big part of what Alex and I do in our roles. Yeah. So we want to kind of, kind of 
focus in a little bit on this quote, um, which is from the book Atomic Habits. I don't know if any of you have read that. But it says, all big things come from small beginnings. The seed of every habit is a single, tiny decision. But as that decision is repeated, a habit sprouts and grows stronger. So it's this idea of, of really starting small. And over time, that's going to compound into something really big. Um, and so really, I think what the takeaway and what we encourage you all to think about is what's one way that you can start small to instill intentional values into your teams um, and even into, into yourselves and, and how you work. Um, and so for those of you in the room who might be team leaders, um, what we'd really encourage you to do is just take the time to just notice how your team behaves. That's really gonna be the first step to identifying maybe some of those implicit values that are driving behavior. And then from there, you know, identifying, hey, what behaviors would I actually wanna see? And how could we instill you know, new values that would drive new behaviors? So take the time to be intentional about observing your team. I've also just spotted our first glaring typo, which given that we're on the like penultimate slide, I feel okay about. But if you're not a leader of a team, if you're a team member, take some time to reflect on how your personal values affect your behavior at work. Uh, and like, think about how like, those, those things that you hold dear, um, whether or not they were like, handed to you by the company, uh, cause you to go through your day-to-day -day life. So with that, thank you very much for joining. Thank you for engaging. And we'd love it to open it up to any questions anyone may have. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, right here. Uh, the, first, I'll start with a comment, which is that a lot of what we heard was around like being explicit about values in creating structures to support those values. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's often a disconnect between the behavior and the intended value, right? Yep. And I think one really thing that I've noticed is hard with adults, and I say adults because I used to work with children, is um, being clear and direct about feedback. So when you notice that someone's behavior isn't matching the value of the team or the organization, that a leader needs to be comfortable saying like, hey, I've noticed you have not taken advantage of your time, yeah. or if you notice they're in PD time, but a student is like at their desk to be like, no, no, <laughs> this is PD time, that that can be really hard for adults to give that corrective feedback to push people back towards those values. Yeah. Um, one thing I wondered was how important is it if you're like a small team in a larger organization for a small team to have its own set of values that are either like in Congress with or maybe diverge from the larger organization's values? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think, in my opinion, I think it's very important. When you, whenever you have a group of people who need to work together to you know, like achieve some common outcome, I think it's really important to have your own kind of what we call team norms. So on the back end team, we have our own set of team norms that I would say like work in concert with the larger instructional values and then the larger kind of values of the entire organization at Turing. Um, but these are really values of like, hey, this is how we're gonna show up every day for each other. This is how we're gonna work with each other to accomplish what we need. And one of those values is to take time for professional development and self care. Um, and yeah, I think, it's, I think it's really important. I don't know, Will, if you have Yeah, I, I would agree. I think, um, you know, to, to your point, Alex, a lot of the values, like, are shared widely across the organization, yeah. um, even if they, like, we're talking about them in a small team. Um, but, like, when we, like, when we are, like, meeting as a team, when we're, like, uh, discussing the, like, the importance of these values, though, that is, like, one of the things that really can bring our team together. Uh, so, 
whether or not like the values are like shared like just across the team or the whole organization, I think like vocalizing um, what those are uh, regularly with that small unit is like one of the most important things. Yep, absolutely. Ah, Jeff has a common question. Oh, no. <laughs> this is Jeff, our executive director at Turing. Uh, if you don't mind, I was gonna like follow up on yeah, what yeah. you said. Yeah. That <clears throat> I think anytime you have different groups of people, you have different collections of values and different ways that those like values are presented or lived up to, right? And it becomes really interesting, I think, to the question about what about my team versus this whole organization or across other teams, that as you move into leadership positions, team lead positions, director positions, what have you, you now like play in different groups at different times, you know? And each of those groups is gonna have a different collection of values, different way of realizing those values. And so as an individual, you really then have to code switch from one group to another, right? And I think when it's unrealistic that like every group is gonna be totally lined up. Yeah. But it's interesting to think about like what's the delta of that code switching? Like if we, when we have our team meetings, can be in one kind of space and one manner of interaction and one uh, set of ideas, and then you can go to your own team, it doesn't have to be the same, it just has to be like not so far that you're like right. getting this whiplash, right? And I think that's one of the situations that can be really difficult, particularly in a large company, where it's like in my small team, we get it, we, worked, we have like this shared vision, we have this shared direction, and then I step into this different environment, a company all hands, and it's just like, uh, how long do I have to tolerate this before I can like go back to the, the place I wanna be, you know? So maybe there's an ideal form where like every group shares values, shares vision, but I think the realistic best case is like to just get them aligned enough that you can like move between different spaces and still feel comfortable in all of them. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah. I would love to hear if you've got uh, like techniques or approaches that you have for teasing out the implicit values. Uh, from uh, an organization so that you can start naming them and identifying them and, and like as an, uh, as, a, as an exercise for a team to do is to figure out what all those things are. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's like, that's probably one of the, like as we were putting this together, we realized it's one of the hardest things to do. Uh, I think it involves a lot of observation of like how, how is the team doing their work? Um, and I, obviously I'm speaking of, like, about this from a leadership position, but uh, like, where do I see work being done in a way that um, is either like, at, in, in conflict with explicit values or just different than um, what I'm like, used to seeing, I guess. So uh, yeah, I, I don't know if you have a better answer for that, Alex. It's, like, it's mm -hmm. difficult. Yeah. I think Something to think about too is understanding, you know, kind of what your team has expressed and kind of where, what your team wants. Um, I think there was a, for me, just like thinking about, you know, the back end team, there was a point where I would hear from instructors, hey, like I'm, I'm kind of fatigued, I'm tired, um, I feel, you know, just kind of like emotionally spent quite often, and then, um, you know, hearing, I think hearing like that, and it's like, I would like time, I, I, want, I don't wanna feel like that when I'm working, right? I don't wanna feel like that on a constant basis. And so taking that information in conjunction with like what I've observed was kind of, I think, what helped put the pieces together. Um, and then thinking of like, what are ways that could energize this team? What are ways that could help someone feel, you know, more engaged with their work and less tired? And it was like growing, you know, having some time to do something that's really fun and exciting to you is super energized. And I got that direct feedback from some of the team members to say, I feel really excited and energized because I got to do, you know, I got to work on this app that I've been wanting to work on for a while 
we got some time to just play um, and, and dive into some code. And I feel really excited. Um, and so I think that's, that's one of the ways that you can really start to, to you know, think about what are some values that you'd actually want to kind of infiltrate and like what are the implicit values there? So I don't know if that's helpful. I would agree with that. I think mm -hmm. you end up asking far more questions than like yeah. giving directions. So Yeah, absolutely. Anybody else? Awesome. Well, we're just about at time. Thank you all so much for coming and have a great rest of your RubyConf. Yeah.